Okay, well now we're going to dig a little deeper in the Gospels. Are you ready? Let's start digging. We're going to start digging. I got my little digger right here, digging into the Gospels. Okay, here's the thing. Ezra and Nehemiah built the temple, right? After Solomon's temple was destroyed, after the 70 year captivity, they come back from Babylon. Ezra, Nehemiah built the temple. And how long did it take for them to build? 20 years, 20 years. And then it lasted about 350 years. Okay, that's how long that lasted. And so Herod's temple really was the third temple, not the second temple, if you think about it, because Ezra and Nehemiah built one. Okay, now Ezra and Nehemiah's temple is the one that was defiled by the Hanukkah story in 168, with the whole story of the Maccabees. Okay, that's the one that was defiled. So now, here we are, and we have Herod's temple, that picture up there during Yeshua's time. And listen, we're going to start with Mark 13, verse 1 and 2. He was going out of the temple, and one of his disciples said to him, Master, see what stones and what buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There's not one stone here resting on another which will not be overturned. Wow. Sometimes we get all excited about the outside, realizing the outside isn't going to last I don't know if you knew this, but historically, they began building the temple about 19 BC. 19 BC is when Herod began building it. And then it was basically completed by 26 CE or 26 AD. Most of it, believe it or not, was built in the first five years of the 40 years. If you look at uh, John 2.20 on your notes, then said the Jews, 46 years was this temple in building, and you're going to raise it up in three days? So this tells you the temple took 46 years to build. And you go from 26 AD, you can go back to 19 BC, and that gives you about the exact timing of the temple. Now, why did Herod build the temple? Does anybody know historically why? I'm going to tell you historically why. Herod was full of wrath over the fact that the rabbis would not acknowledge him as a valid king because he was Edomite, okay? Therefore, he arose and he killed Every one of the rabbis except one, who was his personal counselor. Does anyone remember this man's name? You will never forget it. It is Bava ben Buta. Bava, son of Buta. Now, before we look at those verses underneath, I want to tell you the story. What did he do to all the rabbis? He killed every one of them. And then Herod took Bava ben Buta, the only one he trusted, and poked out his eyes. And then he placed on his head a garland of thorns. And one day, <clears throat> Herod came out to Bava ben Buta, but he changed his voice. Bava ben Buta can't see. So he doesn't know who's sitting down next to him. So Herod disguises his voice and he said, do you see, sir, what this wicked slave Herod does? And Bava Bed Buddha replied, well, what do you want me to do to him? And Herod said, I want you to curse him. But Bava Bed Buddha replied with the verse, even in your thoughts, you should not curse a king. He quotes Ecclesiastes 10.20. And so what does Herod do then? Herod said, but Herod is no king. And Bava ben Buddha replied, well, even though he be only a rich man, it is written, and in your bedchamber, do not curse the rich. <sighs> and so now, what does Herod do? 
He says, but, uh, and, then, and then Baba Ben Buddha said this. He said, well, not only that, be he no more than a prince. It is written, a prince among your people, you shall not curse, which is from here. So he's just quoting scripture to Herod. So Herod says, but this only applies to one who acts as one of your people, but Herod does not act as one of your people. And so Baba Ben Buddha said, but I'm afraid of him. And Herod said to him, but there's nobody who can go and tell him since we too are quite alone. He replied, it is written, for a bird of the heaven will carry the voice and that which has wings shall tell of the matter. Going back to this verse. Okay, so th this is what is going, this, this whole conversation is over this verse. Or, you know, Herod's trying to get him to say something. And then Herod said, I'm Herod. And had I known that you rabbis were so circumspect, I would not have killed them all. Now tell me what amends I can make. And Baba Ben Buddha replied, just as you have extinguished the light of the world by killing all the rabbis, as it is written, from Proverbs 6.23, the commandment is a light and the Torah is a lamp. So Bava ben Buddha said, you go now and attend to the light of the world, which is the temple, as it is written, and all the nations become enlightened by it, from Isaiah 2.2. That's why Herod began to build the temple, because he had killed all these rabbis, but one who answered him correctly and not bad-mouthing Herod, or he would have been killed. And now that is why Herod began to build the temple in 19 BC. So now you know the rest of the story. Okay, so now we go to Mark 13, 14 and 15. What do we see? It says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Okay, so he, this is Yeshua's day. Daniel was like 400 years earlier. And it says, when you see abomination and desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, standing where it shouldn't be, let him that reads understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains and let him that is on the housetop, don't go down to the house, don't even enter there to take anything out of his house. Now, here's what's amazing. That was already fulfilled 168 years earlier during Hanukkah. You have Daniel, a couple hundred years later, you got Hanukkah. A couple hundred years later, you have Yeshua. So what the disciples are thinking, wow, what happened 200 years ago is going to happen again. You follow me? History repeats itself. It cycles. So we saw an abomination of desolation put where it was. That happened during Daniel's time or during uh, Hanukkah. And what did they do? They fled to the mountains. And those that were in the housetop had to leave quickly, not take anything out of the house. So let's look at 1 Maccabees 2, 27 and 28. What happens? This was 200 years earlier. Mattathias cried throughout the city with a loud voice saying, whoever is zealous of the law and maintains the covenant, let him follow me. So he and his sons, what did they do? They fled to the mountains and they left all that they ever had in the city. And so you have to understand Hanukkah is going to repeat itself. And that's what's coming to a planet near you very soon. It's not too many Christians have a Greek mindset, checklist done, won't happen again. It's just the opposite. It's happened, it will happen again. God said, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything that's happened is what's gonna happen. The only thing is there's a different cast of characters on the planet. But the events happen again, they repeat themselves. And then look at this, Mark 13, 16 through 18. Let him that's in the field don't turn back again to take up his garment, but woe to them that are with child. And to them that give suck in those days and pray that your flight not be in winter. When's Hanukkah? In winter. And why does it say, woe to them that are with child? Look what happens 168 years before Messiah at Hanukkah. It was the 15th day of Kislev. In the 145th year, they set up the abomination of desolation. That's Daniel. This is the prophecy of Daniel 200 years later being fulfilled 200 years before Messiah. And they built idol altars throughout the cities of Judah on every side and burned incense at the doors of their own homes and in the streets. 
And when they had written in pieces the Torah, which they found, they burnt the Torah in the fire. And whoever was found with any books, any books of the Tanakh, or if any committed were committed to the Torah, the king's commandment was, they should put them to death. Thus did they by their authority unto the Israelites every month to as many as were found in the cities. And then on the 25th day of the month, when's Hanukkah? The 25th day of Kislev. So this is how Hanukkah began. They sacrificed, you know, a pig upon the idol altar, which was upon the altar of God in Jerusalem. At which time, according to the commandment, they put to death women, and then they had those Israeli women who allowed their children to be circumcised, they hanged the kids around the mother's neck and rifled their houses and slew those that had circumcised them. Howbeit, many in Israel were fully resolved to confirm to themselves not to eat any unclean thing. Wherefore, the rather to die that they might not be defiled with meats and that they might not profane the Holy Covenant. So they died. And there was a very great wrath upon Israel. Wow, this is Hamas, violence, what they're doing. So let's go back to Mark 13, 24 through 26. It says, in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon won't give her light, and the stars of heaven will fall, and the powers that are in heaven will be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. How many of you would like to be alive to see that? Man. Well, this comes from Isaiah. Like I always say, there's nothing new in the New Testament. It's just more commentary on what happened in the Tanakh. Isaiah 13, 6 through 10. How ye for the day of the Lord is at hand. It's going to come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will be faint Every man's heart will melt and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman that travails. They'll be amazed one at another. Their faces will be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate. He will destroy the sinners out of it. And then here we go. The stars of heaven, the constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened and is going forth and the moon will not cause her light to shine. So this is where Mark got this from. Now look at Mark 14, 12 through 15. It was the first day of unleavened bread and they killed the Passover. So Passover isn't a day. Passover is a lamb and they killed the lamb. And his disciples said to him, uh, where do you want us to go to prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent forth two of his disciples and he said to them, go to the city and there you meet a young man bearing a pitcher of water, follow him. And wherever he goes, say to the good man of the house, the master says, where's the guest chamber where I can eat the Passover with my disciples. And then he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared. And that's where I want you to make ready. Okay, so here they are, verse 22 through 26. They're eating the Passover. And Yeshua, having taken bread and blessed and broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, take and eat, this is my body. Now, uh, this isn't the Catholic idea of transubstantiation and the bread miraculously turns into his flesh and they eat his flesh because you're not supposed to eat people. Okay, having taken the cup and giving thanks, he gave it to them and drank it, and he said to them, this is is my blood of the new covenant. In both these, his body and his blood refers to his death, okay? His death is symbolizing a new covenant that's being made, which for many is being poured out. Verily I say to you that no more will I drink of the produce of the vine till that day when I may drink it new in the reign of God. And then it says, having sung a hymn, they went to the Mount of Olives. Who knows the words to the song that they sang? It was Psalms 118, because Psalm 118 is the last hymn every Passover. So if you want to know the words to the song, to that hymn, just go to Psalm 118, and it's amazing. And I've taught on that many times. I don't have time to go into that right now. But that's the hymn that they sang. 
Now, let's take a look at the new covenant that Mark was talking about in Jeremiah 31, verse 31 through 33. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make what? A new covenant. And who's it with? The Gentiles. No, it's not with the Gentiles. It's with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The New Testament is not the new covenant. The New Testament is about the new covenant. Okay? And look, it's not going to be according to the covenant that I made earlier with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, <clears throat> which my covenant they broke, although I was their husband. See, that is when they got engaged, betrothed on Shavuot. The marriage takes place on Tishri 1, Rosh Hashanah, but this is when they were betrothed. And it says, but this is going to be the covenant that I will make with who? The house of Israel, after those days, says the Lord, I'm going to put my Torah in their inward parts. I'm going to write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Okay, let's take a look at the pictures. Here we go. This is the covenant that they broke. Okay, and the Ten Commandments were busted because they were worshiping the golden calf. And they had the book they could have seen. Don't do the golden calf. So they knew better and they broke it. And so what did God do? I'm not going to make it this time on stone tablets, I'm going to put it in their heart. So the law wasn't done away with. The law was relocated. It went from external. How many of you know, anytime someone tells you to do something and it's external, we fight against it. So what does the new covenant is? He puts it in our heart. So we want to do it. That's the difference. Wow. It's like your teenager. They don't want to dump the trash and they rebel or whatever. And then all of a sudden something happens and now they want to do it. It's not that, okay, you don't have to dump the trash anymore. Or now if you don't, you can get away with it. We want to fulfill God's laws. It's, we don't want to get rid of them. We want to know how we can help mom and dad or how we can help our neighbor because we want to, not because we have to. That's the only thing that happened. That's the only thing. The law didn't change. We change. The fault, when you read in Hebrews, it says the fault was with them. It wasn't with the law. The fault is with us. Because just like a little kid, they hate the chain link fence that won't allow them to go play in the street. But the parents love the chain link fence that protects the kids from going into the street. And then what happens? The kid gets older and he has kids and then he loves the fence. What changed? Not the fence but that person's attitude. I hope that makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> then it says in Daniel 7, 13 and 14, he sees in the night visions and there was one like the son of man who was coming with the clouds of heaven. This is in Daniel. He sees the return of the Messiah. <clears throat> and the son of man came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him and there was given him dominion and a glory and a kingdom so that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will never pass away. And his kingdom will never be destroyed. So where does Mark get that? Mark gets that from Daniel. It says in 61 through 64, Mark 14, he held his peace and he answered nothing. Again, the high priest said to him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed? And Yeshua said, well, you're going to see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming where? In the clouds of heaven. Yeshua got that from the book of Daniel because he's the one who told Daniel to write it. And then what did the high priest do? He rent his clothes and he said, what need we any further of witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. Okay. Look at John 18, 31 and 32. They take him to Pilate and Pilate says to them, take him yourselves and let him be judged by your own law. But the Jews said to him, we have no right to put any man to death that the words of Jesus might come true, pointing to the sort of death he would have. Why did the Jews say that 
they have no right to put anyone to death. What? Well, no, because they killed people all the time, the Jews did, for disobeying the Torah. They were even going to stone the adulterous woman. They had no problem killing people. So let me tell you the rest of the story. Okay, here we go. Here is the picture of the temple. On the north side is what is called the chamber of the hewn stone. Here's what it looks on the outside. This is on the north side of the temple faced east. This is on the north side. Here's what the inside looked like, basically. And let me see. I'm going to read to you, and I'll show anyone the book. As you can see, I've got all kinds of tabs in here. I love this book. And if you want to get this book, I, this is a book I'd recommend on Amazon or whatever. But it's the history of the Jewish people during the time of the Messiah. Now, this is written by an Orthodox Jewish author, okay? This is Art Scroll. But it's great to hear their perspective. Everyone has a different perspective. But I want you to hear some of these things that were absolutely amazing. This is the section on why they couldn't kill Yeshua. Okay? <clears throat> it says, um, let me see where I want to start. One of the things they say that happened 40 years before the temple was destroyed, it says the great Sanhedrin left the chamber of the hewn stone and exiled its place somewhere on the outside of the temple area. What that means is, like, for example, Sumner cannot execute somebody. It's got to go to a higher court, okay, the state court, or let's say the federal court. The fact that the great Sanhedrin left the chamber of the hewn stone, there was no one who had the authority to convict someone to die. The fact that they were stoning adulterous women and stoning other people says chaos was reigning. Not that they were allowed. It was total chaos that was going on. Now, listen to this. Only when the Sanhedrin sat in the temple area did other courts have the right to try capital cases. And then it says, 40 years before the destruction of the temple, which is 30 AD, which is when Yeshua died, they go, the rich, listen to this, the rich, think of deep state too, and those with money, the rich, the aggressive, and even some high priest. Herod appointed like three or four high priests. It wasn't just one. They began, the high priests began to engage gangs of robbers and murderers to tyrannize the people and enrich themselves with the loot of the weak and the poor when they came for the festivals. These evil doers, now this is Jews talking about Jews. These evil doers are the ones who acquired Roman citizenship. And so they enjoyed the support of the procurators while they're doing all these evil things. Consequently, the Jewish courts were powerless to prosecute. How do you prosecute the president? Or how do you prosecute the judge? How, the, you know, how do you prosecute the evil doers because they're an authority? Faced with a situation in which they could not enforce the law, the Sanhedrin said it is better not to try them at all rather than to sentence them according to the law without being able to carry out the law. And then listen to what this says. These events mentioned above occurred during the rule of Pontius Pilate. Okay. Uh, but there's a whole bunch more in here that's just phenomenal. But here's, here's the thing. Let me put this up. Because they left the hewn stone, capital cases could not be tried. <laughs> Trials could not be held on Sabbaths. A guilty verdict couldn't be declared. False witnesses were to be dismissed. Defense lawyer always was appointed. The accused can't incriminate themselves. And a warning has to be issued. That's when capital cases took place. Well, the Sanhedrin couldn't try capital cases outside of their regular meeting place on the Temple Mount. And yet here in Yeshua's trial, the judges assembled in a private house. 
No trials could be held on the Sabbath or feast days or on the evening before a festival, and yet Yeshua was tried on the Sabbath, on a festival. A guilty verdict could not be declared the same day as the trial, yet here a verdict was declared within a few hours. Conflicting testimony of false witnesses had to be dismissed, yet here the witnesses' testimony doesn't agree, but the trial still goes on. A defense lawyer was always appointed to defend the accused, yet Yeshua did not, was not allowed a defense lawyer. The accused was not allowed to incriminate himself, yet here the accused's own words in court were the basis for the verdict that they had. The offender was to have been verbally warned by two witnesses that the deed he was about to commit was a crime before he could stand trial, and at most, the council should have issued a warning and dismissed him. A charge of blasphemy, which often rested upon a misuse of the tetragrammaton or a misuse of the name of God, could not be leveled against Yeshua here. Okay? And then, what do we see happens? In Mark 14, 63 and 64, what did the high priest do? He rent his clothes. And he says, what do we need further witnesses for? You heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. And yet look at Leviticus 21.10. Whoever is the high priest upon whose head the anointing oil was poured that is consecrated to put on the garments shall not uncover his head or rent his clothes. They were doing everything out of the line of Torah. Okay, now here comes the next one. We're going through Mark 14 today of the Gospels. This is what we're doing is digging deeper. Look at Mark 14, 72. The second time the cock crew and Peter called to mind the word that Yeshua said unto him before the cock crowed twice. Then you will deny me three times. And when he thought they're wrong, he wept. Okay. At the PowerPoints. Here we go. Many people think that the rooster that was crowing cock a doodle do is what happened. But I'm sorry, that is not correct. It had nothing to do with the rooster because the cock crow was not a rooster. That word in Hebrew is a giver. Here it is in Hebrew. But guess what? The translation, this other word above means rooster. But that wasn't the Hebrew word. It was giver, which means a person. But it can also be a rooster. So what happened, for example, whenever there was a new moon or different things, there would be a priest in the temple who would light a lamp. And then you see in the far corner, the guy up high would light a lamp. And then pretty soon all around into Babylon, they would be lighting torches up on mountains. So everyone would know uh, when the festival began. Well, also here we have the temple. There was a priest who would cry out and he was called the rooster. There wasn't a rooster. It was a man. And he says, by the third time he crows, you will have denied me. Here's the phrases that he would cry every morning at sunrise. He would cry out, it is daylight. The whole eastern sky is lit. And then someone would ask him, as far as Hebron. And the second crow was, yes, as far as Hebron. And then the third calling was, arise, you priests, for your service, you Levites, for your platform and Israel for your post. It's time to start the morning service. That was the cock crow. It wasn't a rooster. They never allowed chickens and roosters in Jerusalem because who wants to have a slaughterhouse next to an outdoor church service? Everyone could smell. I used to live in Garden City, Kansas, and uh, IBP built this big you know, slaughtering house for beef. And man, for miles, you could smell the slaughterhouse. Well, they didn't want you smelling a slaughtering house of chickens. There never were chickens and roosters allowed in Jerusalem. So when it talks about the cockroach, it's talking about the priest who had the title of the rooster. Okay. This is from Easton's Bible Dictionary. He says, in our Lord's time, the Jews had adopted the Greek and Roman division of the night into four watches, each consisting of three hours. Uh, the first beginning at six, and, and he goes through. Uh, and then he says, but the ancient division known as the first and second cock crowing was still going on. Then this is from ancient, ancient Jewish literature. What is the definition of a cock crow? It's the call of a man. The commencement of all services had to be heralded and many heralds were employed. As a matter of fact, 
A man named Gabini was the herald in chief. His duty was mainly to call out in the morning, priests to your duties, Levites to your chants, Israelites to your places. And then it says on festivals, when there were many sacrifices, Israelites would come very early and it was done at the first watch and before the cock crow and the temple court was full of Israelites. So when you read about the cock crow in the gospels, it had nothing to do with a rooster. It was a priest who had that title. Ta-da. All right, let's stand. <laughs> 